Okay, so 310, relatively simple idea. So we're going to be talking about, or the big idea in 310, is this idea of a linearization. So what is a linearization? It means that we're going to approximate a curve with a straight line. So if we look at very close to that, uh, you're okay. Very close to that point which the line is tangent to the curve at. It's okay. That straight line will do a good job of approximating the values on that curve, right? The further away we get, the worse we'd expect that uh, approximation to be. Everybody's okay with that idea? That is, in essence, everything that we're going to be doing in 310. So we're going to be writing tangent lines and then using them to approximate values. That's it. That's the whole idea. Now, the notation gets a little funny, but that's the gist of it. So, if I look at the equation for the tangent line to the curve y equals f of x at x equal a, that's our tangent line. What is this formula here? Just the point slope equation for a line, right? It just rearranged where we're calling this. Our point, is, yes, is a comma f of a, right? But in general, like nothing wonky here, right? Just the equation for a line. It's tangent to the curve, or the equation for the line tangent to the curve at x equals a. Now, what we can do is, again, as long as I'm near a, this tangent line will provide a pretty good approximation for the values on the curve, right? You know, if I look at like that, well, let's just do it down here. Like this group of x values, the tangent line provides a pretty good estimate, right? We're going to call that estimation the linear approximation or the linearization of f of x. We use L of x to denote our linearization or our linear approximation. Those two terms can be used interchangeably. So let's look at an example. It says find the linearization of f of x equals the square root of x plus 3 at a equals 1 and then use it to approximate the numbers 3.98 and 4.0, the square root of 3.98 and the square root of 4.05. Are these approximations overestimates or underestimates? Okay. Well, to get my linearization, I need the slope. So to get that, I'm going to do the derivative of f of x. To differentiate f of x equals the square root of x plus 3, what do I need to use? Chain rule. Very good. So that's going to be 1 half x plus 3 to the negative 1 half and then times 1. Feel okay there? The slope then is going to be f prime of 1. So, calculus students, 1 plus 3 is 4. 
to the 1 half power to the negative 1 times 1 half. Everybody's okay? Should be able to do that in your head, right? And then I need the point. So the x coordinate of our point is A. What is the y coordinate going to be? Yeah, it's going to be f of 1. So that should be 2. So my linearization is 2 plus 1 fourth times x minus 1. Or if I care, I can write it 1 fourth x plus 1.5. Everybody's okay there? Oops, not 1.5, 1.75. Feel good? So now let's do the approximations. So the square root of 3.9, or 3.98, excuse me, is 0.98 plus 3, right? If I'm looking at my function for f of x, which would be approximately L of 0.98. So I get one point nine nine five. So far, so good. What about 4.05? How do I write that? Nope. Nope. 1.05 plus 3. Right? It's got to uh, fit in that form. This, we're doing the square root of x plus 3. So if we're doing the square root of 4.05, what does x have to be? Oh. Right? It's just like. So plug it into our linearization. So I have two oh one two five. Now, if it's asking me if this is an underestimate or an overestimate, what would be the easiest way to check that? Well, I'm not graphing boo diddly to make it the easiest way. No way. Yeah, I'm just typing the square root to my calculator, dude. Right? What did I get? Over. 
So that's over. Let's look at the other one. Also over, right? <coughs> what if I didn't have access to a calculator to do this? Now I'm going to think about what the graph would look like. That would be what our graph looks like, correct? When x is negative 3, it should be 0. Anything less than that is going to be undefined because you're taking the square root of a negative. So this is like your point 1, 2 right there. If we draw our tangent line, is our tangent line above or below the curve? Above, everywhere except at that point 102 where it touches. So are the values on the curve going to be higher or lower than the tangent line? Lower. Lower. So the tangent line is an overestimate because it's higher than the curve for really all values of x other than the point 1 or when x equals 1. Does that feel okay? So either way of kind of looking at it, whether you have access to a calculator, or if you have to do it kind of conceptually, you should still be able to ascertain whether something is an underestimate or overestimate. Does that feel okay there? All right. Um, so here it says for what values of x is the linear approximation for the square root of x plus 3 accurate within 0. 0.5 and then 0. 0.1. We're just going to do one of those to be honest with you because once you've done it one, one of them, you've done it for all of them, right? So what am I going to, uh, how am I going to be solving for this? How am I going to solve that? Well, that's what this is, right? That is our linear state. That's what it's saying. So this is like our f of x over here, and that's like our l of x. Nope. So accurate within 0.5. So that means the distance between f of x and l of x should be less than 0.5, right? Is everybody okay with that notion? We use the absolute values because we're looking for a distance, right? So to solve this equation for x, what's the first thing I want to do? Fantastic. That's what I would want to do as well. Get rid of the absolute values. 
How do I do that with an equate with an inequality like this? Well, I make it like a compound inequality, right? So I just say, okay, well, that's the same thing as being between negative point oh, or point 0.5 and positive point 0.5, right? Okay. And then now I'm either going to get the uh, the L of x or f of x alone in the inside. It doesn't really matter which one. I would probably go with the f of x. Or I'm sorry, they get the L of x alone because it's just like one thing to move around. But it doesn't really matter. And then I want to get that to be positive L of x. So what is going to happen? Multiply by negative. But in doing so, that's going to flip the inequalities as well as the positive and negative signs. So far, so good. Okay. So if I plug this stuff all in, I need to solve this now. How is going to be the easiest way to do this part? Yeah, so I'm going to solve this part first. And then I'll do this part second. Everybody's okay with that plan? Um, but to do that, I think I'm probably just going to use my calculator because Solving these two things equal to each other is going to stink. That's going to be like super duper uber messy. And the algebra is going to really be pretty tedious. So I'm just going to graph one side of my equation, the 0.05 or 0.5. Jeez, point, 0 0.5 uh, plus root x plus 3 and then 7 fourths plus x over 4. So I'm going to just graph that right now. Now let's think about the window. This is going to be between, or it's going to be a surrounding the point 1, 2, because notice this is still the same situation from the previous example. So I need it to be just near the point 1, 2. So maybe x is from 0 to 2 might be enough. And then y's should be, I don't know, maybe 1 to, uh, 1 to 3 or something. And let's just take a look. Actually, let's hold on for a second. I'm going to make these two different. So the uh, the line is going to be the is I'm going to use the thick line to graph the L of x. Okay, just so we can tell the difference of what we're looking at. So this is my f of x. That's my L of x. Okay. Well, I don't see any intersection right now. What if I extend that out a little bit? Okay. Well, 
this is kind of curving down and that's kind of curving up. I'm still a little suspicious. I'm going to make that maybe a little bit wider and maybe knock that up a unit or two. So there's my, there we go. Now I got some intersections, right? So what I'm looking for is when the thin line is above the thick line, right? Which looks like it's happening in between this intersection and this intersection. Everybody agree? So second, trace, choosing the intersect command. Enter, enter, and then I need to do a good guess here because there's two intersections, so I want to make sure I get the right one. So I'm going to move close. So I have negative uh, 657. Let's just do three decimal places is probably enough. And then let's get this other one over here. Second, trace intersect command, enter, enter, and then the guess has to be good because there's more than one intersection, so it's got to be pretty close for it to find the one I'm looking for. It's probably good. So, well, we'll call that 867. Feels okay? Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to do the other inequality. So I'm going to turn off that part and graph a new one. So my thin line here is going to be the root x plus 3 minus 0.5. And I want that to be under the thick line. So let's hit graph again and take a look. So here's my thick line, and there's that, right? Okay, well, looks like everything I care about is happening pretty close to, uh, I don't know, maybe from like zero to two or something. So I'm gonna take a little bit closer look, and it looks like between one and two there should be fine. Maybe that I, if I look, what do we see here? It's under there the whole time, doesn't it? So what would I say here? So there, that lower bound is always going to be true. You guys okay there? And so what I want then is the intersection of these two intervals, right? Now, how do you do that intersection? Well, if I think about it on the number line, there I think so what's the overlap between these two sets just that right That's my range of x's in which my error is within 0.5. So I'd say that's probably a pretty good estimate. So that what this allows us to do now is, okay, my approximation is good enough for this set of x's, right? That's basically what we've said. 
Everybody's okay with that? Okay. And again, what would be what would the difference be if we made the um, error point one instead of point oh five? It's just point ones instead of point oh fives, but you do everything exactly the same, right? All right. Um, so here, we're going to think about this in terms of um, differentials. So we have the same picture. Our curve f of x is blue, and our linear linearization is the pink line, right? We're going to pick some point x plus delta x. This is like my input that we're approximating, so I'm doing like L of x plus delta x. The output there is going to be the y coordinate for point R, right? The actual value would be the y coordinate for this point Q right there, right? Now, if I think about this here, the slope for um, that tangent line is going to be like dy dx, right? So that's the change in height from like yr minus yp over xr minus xp. So we're saying delta y, or I'm sorry, dy is the distance from the y coordinate of s, or of r, to the y coordinate of p, which is exactly what the diagram is indicating. And dx is the distance between the x-coordinate of r and the x-coordinate of p, just like the diagram indicates. If I look at delta y, that's the change between um, the y-coordinate of q minus the y-coordinate from p. Because notice p is on both curves, right? f and, R, f and l. And delta x is also going to be then the, um, because r and q same, share the same x-coordinate, it's going to be the x from q minus the x from p. But notice that x, p, I'm sorry, the x from r and the x from q are the same x, right? So that's, that's all this picture is kind of, of saying. So if we think about this, this delta y is going to be this, which is y um, q, right, minus f of x, which is y p. Right, that's all this formula is saying. And we know here that if I like just divide both sides by dx, right, 
dy dx is f prime. Well, der der der, it's what it's always been, right? Okay, so let's think about these two examples here. So I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. So it says compare the values of delta y and dy if y equals f of x equals yada 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 and x changes um, from 2 to 0 0.05 and then from 2 to 0 0.01. All right. So the dx is going to be the same as the delta x which would be 0.05. Everybody's okay with that? f prime of x is going to be 3x squared plus 2x squared minus 2. So if I use this formula, dy is going to equal um, three x squared plus two x or super dupers two x minus two dx. But remember, what is this? That is like y uh, p. Yeah. So There I get 0 0.07, and I crank that through. Right? It's 12, 16 minus 2 is 14. Oh, my goodness, guys. That's supposed to be 0 0.05. Good, great googly mooglies, Kulik. Some pretty terrible arithmetic there. If I use this formula then, my delta y is going to be th uh, is going to be plugging into f. What am I going to be plugging into f though? This guy, which is like x plus. Right, and this is like x, and this is like x plus delta x. So we have 205 cubed plus 205 squared minus 2 times 205 minus 1, and then minus f of x, which is 2 cubed plus 2 squared minus 2 times 2 plus 1, which comes out to be, yo, yuckarooskies. Uh, let me just cheat and write it down. 0140701 is what the textbook says. Oops. I lied. I was looking at the one for 0 0.01. Uh, it's 0.717625. Because 
again, what did we do here? Right? And what are we doing here? Right, we're just using those two formulas we outlined above. Let's do last example. It says the radius of a sphere was measured to be found to be 21 centimeters with a possible error of 0.05 centimeter. What is the maximum error in using the value of the radius to compute the volume of the sphere? Well, let's think about this for a moment. Um, what's the volume for a sphere? got to be three measurements multiplied together because it's a cubic, it's a volume, right? So if I want to differentiate this with respect to R, what would I get? So I'm doing like DDR to both sides. What's the derivative of V? One. Okay, and then dV dr, right? Like it's implicit differentiation. What's the derivative of pi r cubed? Three, uh, uh, Three pi r squared. And again, I don't get a differential from that piece because I'm differentiating r's with respect to r's. If I multiply both sides then by dr, I get this formula. Yes? Where that's just the formula for a sphere. Oh! Why did why did we drop it? I didn't mean to. That's because I got excited and carried away. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. When you start seeing me doing something dumb, I need you to yell sooner so I have less stuff to erase. So it's easier on me, okay? Even if you're not sure if I'm making a mistake, feel free to ask, right? As soon as you see me start seemingly doing something dumb, you know, when I write 0.5 instead of 0.05, when I drop a four thirds for no good reason, Right? Everybody's okay? Still doing doing okay? Okay, great. So what is this telling me? That's my dr. That's my r. Yes, of course. <laughs> Sorry, because you no, 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 no. Go, 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 go. As soon as you see him, holler at me. Yes, of course it should be. Thank you. Okay. 
So this, that is our maximum error, right? What is our relative error? What would that be? That would just be the change in volumes divided by actual volume, right? which is approximately going to be dv over v, which we have a formula for right here. And volume we have a formula for. right there. So what do we end up with? 3dr over r. Oh, that's not right. What does this look like? Uh, in science. Yeah, in science. What did we just do there? It's not acceleration. Yes. So if we wanted a percent error, what can we do with that that we just got? Multiply it by 100. I know, that was a tough poll asking you to recognize that as being like related to percent error. I thought maybe because we were talking about error, somebody would have made a stab at it, but that's okay. The error piece is kind of, once you do some, it'll feel a little bit more clear. But the big idea, the piece that we really want, the piece that the AP is gonna ask you about, is to create a linearization and then use that to approximate a value, which is just doing what? Writing a tangent line and then plugging some number of, for x into that equation for the tangent line, right? That's all we're really talking about. That's the piece the AP will ask about, more likely than not. I don't think, in my experience, I don't see them asking a whole lot about error, although I might. Um, that'll finish up 310 and this block of sections for the next test as long as we're here and talking if we look at the test 3 tab in OneNote I have the test description 
So here the format will be a little bit different than last time because the note calculator section is the problem section of the test and the calculator section of the test is the multiple choice part of the test. I don't think it makes too much of a difference to me. But, you know, I want you to get used to doing multiple choice questions or free response questions without a calculator a little bit more than we have so far because you have four sections on the AP exam, right? Multiple choice with and without, free response with and without. So just trying to change the format around a little bit so that we get some practice doing problems without a calculator also because we haven't really done much of that yet. You know what I mean? Um, and again, the format's pretty similar, right, in terms of number of problems and distribution, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so skills you should be able to demonstrate. You should be able to take the derivative of a function involving combinations of the derivative rules, including but not limited to product, quotient, power, exponent, logarithm, trig, inverse trig, chain, the whole shebang, right? All the rules we've learned to this point, which is coincidentally all the rules you're going to see. Um, you should be able to use your calculator to take the derivative of a function at a point. Remember we showed you guys how to do that last time? Um, particularly on the sections where you're allowed a calculator. You should do that whenever possible to make your life as quick as you can. Um, you should be able to calculate the derivative of an inverse at a point. So again, that was like our uh, three, five, or three, four bonus content that we did some examples in, right? And you see a whole bunch of that in the AP practice questions I give you. Should be able to calculate dy dx using implicit differentiation and d squared y dx squared using implicit differentiation. Again, that's just the first and second derivatives. Yes. Wait, so for the first rule of the point, like take the derivative of like a function, like is that just like everything, like chain rule, sine inverse rule? Okay, and then also, why would you need to use your calculator to take the derivative of a function at a point? You don't need to, but often it'll be easier because oh, okay. the calculator will just spit out the number for you. Okay. Right? Maybe it'd be a problem where like it has like a bunch of the rules all in combination with each other and just looks like a nightmare to do by hand. Okay. Right? Um, you should be able to write the equation of a, for a tangent line even with a um, for an implicitly defined curve, right? Again, we did that in the 3, 5 homework, I think. And then you should be able to find the linearization for a function and use that linearization to approximate values. Um, things you should look over, I have a block of multiple choice and free response questions that I've put onto OneNote. So if you look at this, I think there's 60 multiple choices, and at the end I think I have you know, three or four free response ones in here. Yeah, so 60 multiple choice. And then we have a couple of free response at the end, just three, I guess. Um, you'll also notice that I put in a key here also. Um, this is just like my work, the way that I would have approached doing these ones. If this ever wants to come in, it takes a minute sometimes. It's a lot of pages of PDF. And it's going to be slower because it's a scan, so the resolution will probably be better because I needed to do, like, pick up pencil strokes and stuff. Any time now, computer. This is infuriating sometimes, isn't it? There it goes. So, like, again, I wrote in, like, a little bit of scratch work on the side to show you guys what I was doing. Maybe it's not the most complete scratch work in the entire world, but like I tried to write a little bit of something for every one of these problems so that you have some clue as to what I was doing to get the answer. Um, and then I said also you might want to look at 
12 and 14 from 3-3, three, three, 44 through 46 from 3-4, three, 3.5, 25 to 29, with second derivative problems like 29 through, or 27 through 29, 3-6, 13 and 20, 3-10, 5 through 6. So I just listed some more <laughs> problems that I thought would be good ones to look at. Um, Wednesday will be just a review day. You guys can, we can spend that day, you know, working on stuff or asking questions or both or whatever. Um, and then Friday's the tentative test date for this. Um, if we get to Wednesday and Friday, looks like a particularly bad test day. Um, we can certainly push the test into next week if that feels like a better option for everybody. Um, but I would want to start a neck, another lesson on Friday. Can't just like keep adding review days, but we can bump the test day. We're not adding more content to the test. We're just starting like the next test content before we've taken test three or whatever, right? So think on that. We don't need to make any decisions till Wednesday. See what the rest of your week starts shaping up as. I know that it's kind of getting to be the busy time of year, you know, for everybody. Um, oh, you know what we didn't, I didn't ask anybody if we had questions from homework. I should have done that before we started. I just got so excited to talk about linearizations. Um, do we want to do some homework questions? I know somebody was asking something about somethings. That was couldn't be more vague, Mr. Kulik. Number four, that was the one. So let's do that real quick. Well, not real quick, because there's like eye parts to it. There's like the pupil and the iris and that jelly stuff, the cornea, the lens. Nobody likes this. I'm going to keep going until you start laughing at my jokes. I said eye parts. No, still we don't get it? Gosh, you guys. Yeah, it's okay. All right. So part A uh, wants the velocity. So if I look at this, what am I going to have to use to differentiate that? Before the chain, I need product rule. So I have t times the derivative of e to the negative t over 2 plus e to the negative t over 2 times the derivative of t. To do the derivative of e to the negative t over 2, that requires a chain rule. So the derivative of the outside is just e to the negative t over 2, and then times the derivative of the inside, and the derivative of t is just 1. What's the derivative of negative t over 2? Come on, guys. Negative a half. And then let's just say, what do we got here? Uh, if I factor out a negative t over 2, that's going to give me a 2 minus t e to the negative t over 2, something like that. I guess it doesn't really matter. That factoring is probably not worth doing. Um, part B says find the velocity after three seconds. Well, what do we got here? Um, so that's negative 1.5 times negative 1. That's positive 1.5 e to the 3 over 2, whatever that is. You know, it's a good check here, though, that you could do. So 
So that's negative 3 over 2. Because sometimes even Mr. Kulik uh, gets going fast and doubts himself. Again, I didn't tell you that you had to show your work. So on a problem like this, if it's in the calculator section, I'm just doing this. Ah! Oh my god. That scared me, Mr. Gold. Where did I go wrong there? Oh no! Where was my mistake? Oh yeah, I, I did all kinds of dumb stuff in here. Okay. C. When is the particle at rest? What am I solving for there? Yeah. So here the factored form would come in handy, right? Now to do this, I have to make sure that I'm applying the zero product property. So I take each factor of the product and set it equal to zero. Can an exponential function ever equal zero if there's nothing added or subtracted from it? No. No. So that part just has no solution. So here I'll subtract the 1 over and multiply by negative 2 to get t equals 2. Part D says, when is the particle moving in the positive direction? So 2, I'll pick t equals 0, and then t equals 3. Well, t equals 3, we already know the answer to, right? We know it's negative. If I do v of 0, what do I get there? I get, zero, I get 1 <coughs> times 1. So that's positive. So we are going forward from 0 to 2. And we're backward from 2 to positive infinity. Oh, I guess we should, yeah, whatever. I'm going to say forward and backward. Uh, says find the total distance traveled. Okay, so the absolute value of s of 0 minus s of 2 plus the absolute value of s of 2. Uh, oh, in the first eight seconds, okay. Minus S of eight, I was like, infinity's gonna be rough. So math, number ABS, Y one of zero, minus y1 of 2 plus math number abs y1 of 2 minus fars not fars function y1 of 8 
So I get about 1.32. I think these are meters. Right, and it say that this is going something, yeah, feet. Sorry, feet. Um, F says draw a diagram like figure two, okay? So let's do that. So we know that we are going forward from 0 to 2, right? And then we turn around. Going from 0 to 2, though, we didn't go very far. Right, we only went that far. But if we go from two, yeah, should I? Sure. Um, okay. So this was t equals two, s would be uh, point. Seven three six or something, and then going back forever. Right? So it's something like that. This is t equals zero, s equals zero. Feel okay? Um G acceleration. So remember, uh, acceleration is the first derivative of velocity. So we're doing DDT of uh, 1 minus T over 2 times E to the negative T over 2. So product rule again, chain rules in there. Is that okay? Um, I noticed that I have a negative one half e to the negative t over two in common with both parts. So I'm gonna have a one minus and then plus one. So really I'm just gonna write that as two. And then it said, what is the thing at three? Acceleration after three seconds. So if I do that, I have uh, two minus three halves is 0. 0.5 or one half times, that's gonna be negative one fourth. And then that's still gonna be uh, three over two, whatever that is. And then this be feet per second squared because it's acceleration. Um, and then I, when is the particle moving, speeding up, and when is it slowing down? So here I need the deriv or the uh, acceleration set equal to zero. So I'll have that piece equal to zero. 
and that p is equal to 0. Clearly, that has no solution as it's exponential. Subtract the 2 over and then multiply by negative 2. I get t equals 4. Um, so if I pick a value that's less than 4, I know that the acceleration is negative. So greater than 4. Uh, it should be positive because I'll have a um, if I pick say 5 there I'm going to have a negative times a negative will give me a positive so now to map this all out so I have t0 t3 t4 um, so from 0 to 3, my velocity was negative, nope, 0 to 2, sorry. My velocity is positive. And then from 2 on, my velocity is negative. And then uh, my acceleration is negative from 0 to 4. And it's positive afterwards. So I know that we're speeding up where the two signs agree. So if I look, acceleration and velocity are both negative there. And then they are I have acceleration negative but velocity positive there and then velocity negative but acceleration positive there so in those two sections we are slowing down whoa Boise that's not what I wanted Does that feel okay? I know that's a lot to sort through. Especially when the derivatives were not trivial, right? Because if you mucked up one of those, like good luck, everything after it's going to be wrong. Yeah. There's, the chains were hard. You know, like seeing the chain rule inside the product rule and stuff was, was not trivial to get. Um, but that is a place where if it's a calculator allowed problem, you know, Brooke, to be able to do this to check to make sure your derivative was correct is helpful, right? Because if you have the correct derivative here, you can do the same check with the acceleration later. And then it becomes a little bit help, you know, more reasonable to get the correct answers if you can like, oops, what did I do wrong? I'm not getting you know, the derivative that I calculated by hand isn't matching what the calculator is giving me. I mean, if it's off by like, you know, like one in the seventh decimal place or something, I wouldn't worry about it. But if it's like, wasn't even close, where I did some dumb factoring thing wrong, I caught it right away because I checked it. You know what I'm saying? Um, oh boy, that took a lot of time, didn't that? Sorry, I gave you just so many of those to do.
How many did I ask you to do? Two of those. Well, that's not as, I guess that's better than I thought I did. Could you imagine if I gave you like six of them? There wasn't even six to do. Don't cry for me, students. All right.